Hello, nurses, and welcome to this episode of the Functional Nurse Podcast. My name is Bridget Sager, and I'm your host. I am excited today to be interviewing Rose Achola, and she's a family nurse practitioner. Rose, thanks so much for being here with us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, totally. I think we're going to have a great chat. Um, I'm going to tell everybody a little bit more about you, and then we'll get started. Uh, Rose has always had a passion for healthcare and embracing holistic health has felt like coming home for her. She is an ICU nurse with 13 years of experience and a family nurse practitioner since 2021, a mom of two amazing kids and is navigating the teenage years while co-parenting. So we have a lot in common. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rose started out so excited and nervous to help in primary care, but soon felt lost and that she wasn't doing enough. She found functional medicine through Inca completed the functional medicine for nurses course and the nurse coaching course simultaneously and has been obsessed ever since. She currently still practices in the allopathic model while working with clients to help mitigate chronic disease and hormone imbalance for overall better quality of life and longevity. She started RA Coaching and Consulting LLC in December of 2023. Rose, would you start by just telling us about your journey to nursing? It sounds a lot like mine and <laughs> raising the two teenagers, all of it. Um, it's your journey to becoming a nurse and ultimately where you are now. Yeah, hi. of course. Um, hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, my journey started in high school when my sister got her wisdom teeth out. And I was so excited to make the little chart. And okay, she got her meds this time and she got this this time. And I was like, oh, this, I don't know. There was something about that that I liked. Um, and <laughs> that was, you know, after two major changes. I started out biology, then went to public health, and then got into nursing. Um, so I had a little bit of a roundabout. Started right into the ICU from nursing and I loved it. Um, there was something about seeing things happen and being and knowing where to stop in the algorithm of like sepsis or something along those lines, anticipating the next move. There's something along those lines that I just, I loved it. Um, when I wanted to go to NP school, I thought I wanted to be in the hospital working as an acute care nurse practitioner, but the program that I applied for, that program wasn't ready yet. So my hand was kind of forced to either wait it out and take farm again, <laughs> which that was not going to be an option. Um, or do family practice. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll do family practice. Um, during NP school, I also was teaching um, undergrad nursing students. And so that was awesome because I was in the classroom and I was also in clinical. And um, when I got into primary care, I was blown away about how many people don't feel well. Because all I saw was people in the hospital, the sickest of the sick. And so I'm thinking that, oh, people are, you know, feeling well, okay, and moving around and, and about. So when I got into family practice, I was I was shocked that a lot of people just don't feel good don't... every day. Um, and then how we're taught to take care of patients is what we know, but the system, as we know, is, is broken. The system is broken. Um, it's really hard to help people feel better in a timely fashion with only 15, 20 minute yeah. appointments. Um, and so when I started getting into functional medicine and really getting to the root, because I found that when I was talking with patients, my appointments and my sessions mm -hmm. were more than those 20 minutes, were more than those 15 minutes, because I wanted to keep digging. I wanted to know what else was going on, what else could be an issue. And nope. um, <laughs> you can't really build for that. And you have to be very creative. Yeah, you, know, you, can't, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you do. You do. And so um, I've worked both in a post-acute care setting and also in a um, like office setting as far as as an NP. And um, so then when I started getting into functional medicine, I was like, oh, literally felt like coming home because it's like I can get the answers. It may take a little bit, but I love the yep. Magnum PI aspect of finding out what else is going on to really, you know, give some insight. And I really do feel that like when you get into that and when you ask them all those questions, you're really giving them a true yeah. choice, right? So it's either you can either try this or there's this option or there's this option. And then just really supporting, um, supporting the patient, supporting the client. 
And so I kind of, you know, not mm-hmm. went rogue, but took a little left turn. And I kind of like, yeah. So just try to navigate I, both I, roles. I, I love your story of your journey. And it really is. I, it sounds like you're saying mine. And, and the, you know, I was still in primary care learning functional medicine <laughs> and trying to add it in. And then starting my own practice on the side because I was like, I need more time with people if I really want to be able to do this. And I'm like super the same Magnum PI, like digging deep, looking at the labs. Um, That takes time. And I think, you know, you know, in the course, we talk a lot in the Zoom meetings about like, you can do this anywhere. You know, I was talking to students about that on Zoom yesterday. Like, people were giving examples of like using it in the emergency room to ask like what happened right before this and uncovering, you know, grief and not a cardiac event, you know, um, we can use this everywhere, but it is so fun to be able to do the like deep dive and spend time with people. Um, Can you share a little bit more about like, so now you are still in primary care. And so you're doing a little bit about what it's like there to, to be trying to sprinkle this in and figure out who, to share this with time-wise, right? And then and then tell us about your your new venture. Yeah. So um, for, as an NP, I work and have worked in two different aspects. So I've done the office setting where I'm working with patients who are coming in for either sick visits or well visits or things like that. Um, and getting a little bit more into their medications because you know, I work with adults. And so if I have a patient who's in, you know, their 50s or 40s or 60s, they've been on certain medications for years, whether it's appropriate or not. So it's kind of getting a little bit of a a little bit more as far as, you know, what was the reason for this to be initiated? How do you feel on it? What are your thoughts? Things like that, um, (laughs) as far as sprinkling in some of the functional pieces or looking to see that they've never gotten their vitamin D checked and they're in their sixties and their, you know, nutrition isn't near it. Um, you know, there could be some room for improvement in areas like nutrition and things like that. So kind of just pulling in those things. So if somebody comes in for an ailment, instead of writing a prescription, I ask a little bit more questions as far as where that ailment could be coming from. Um, something a little bit similar in the post-acute area. So, these patients that I take care of, I'm kind of like their NP when they get discharged from the hospital. So whether it's their post-surgical, um, a lot of post-surgical, post-medical patients that come in to a post-acute session and before um, area, and then they go home. So I'm managing acute issues and chronic issues. And um, it's kind of hard because you don't, yeah. I don't follow the patients when they leave. So there's a lot of education that happens in that space, which I really do like. Um, and I feel like that's, I don't know, 75% of it, 90% of it is the education almost like, Hey, did you know, or how are you okay with us checking you for this? Um, and, um, so I like it. So that's, that's the part. And that's kind of how I sprinkle in some of the functional medicine pieces. The nutrition is hard because in a post-acute setting, they don't really have any control of what they're eating. So then it's more education of, um, you know, if you're hungry and you really don't have that big of an appetite, choosing the foods on your plate that you'll benefit more. So it's more about choosing those pieces and choosing those um, parts of nutrition to sort of help. So, okay. So now I want to hear more about your, now you've started your own practice recently. So I'd like to hear more about like, and I know my listeners do too, that like, what, what does your new practice look like? What are you offering? Yeah. So um, the new practice, um, but a quick caveat, I never pictured myself working for myself, being an entrepreneur, having my own practice. That was something that was so far left field. So just wrapping my brain around me wanting to do it was one transition. Um, And then the second transition was actually doing it because there's a lot of unknowns and the business end is very, it's just a learning curve that I keep finding, keep learning. It's cool, but it's also, you know, a big learning curve. But the clients that I have, um, being that I'm a family NP, a primary care NP, there's the blanket of opportunity that's there. So I'm not just one specialty. So I do, I love chronic disease. I really do. So whether that's hypertension, diabetes, cardiac disease, um, because I feel like from working bedside, 
a lot of those heavy hitter diseases yeah. are what we were taking care of, seeing the sequela over years of either mismanagement or um, other just complications that you have. So I love the idea of mitigating it and kind of getting ahead of it before it takes over. Um, so I do like working with a lot of clients, male and females, who do have either a chronic disease that they want to try to mitigate. Um, I love working with people who don't really have a diagnosis but want to know how to stay well. Because um, I feel like that's also a population, yeah. too, where they go to the doctor and like, oh, you're fine. But they want to know a little bit more about what they can do to fully just really live and live well and grow and age well. Um, and there's also the population of the women in their late 30s, 60s, 70s, with the a lot of the different hormonal shifting and kind of having a lot of questions and not really knowing what to do and where to start. Um, and I'm working with a lot of women in that in that aspect right now. So it's a little <laughs> bit of all over the place, <laughs> but there is a cohesive story in there. The story is um, empowerment through education and really being listened to and being heard and given a plan. Um, and I love the part about helping yes. somebody how they're ready to be helped, right? So like there's a coaching aspect, which I love because then you can find where those sticking points are. But then I really do feel like listening to the client and what their capacity is, what they're capable of doing at that moment. I feel like that is huge because if you're given a treatment plan that you know is not something that you're really able to yeah, do. Yeah, we can preach at people all day long, right? But it. like what what is yeah, what is some what are, what are they yeah. capable of changing? What are they motivated to change? And so I would love to hear more about, you know, I know, you know, in Ooh. the course we talk about like, oh, how much of your practice is nurse coaching and how much is education and functional and that that is a duality, you know, um, they're they're not in conflict with one another, but they're kind of opposite. And so I, I'd like to hear like in your practice, how you have learned nurse coaching through Inca and now you're incorporating functional medicine and being an educator, which it sounds like you love. So what does that look like for you? So that's also that's very variable and that's tailored. So um, I have clients that I work with in a like coaching container. So usually all my visits start with a functional medicine workup. So there's a questionnaire that they will answer, a treatment plan that we'll kind of go through. And then from there, um, whether beforehand or even afterwards, we look to see, well, how much support do you need for these changes to kind of go through? So those who need a little bit more support, now they're with me for like a three-month coaching container. And in that coaching container, we go through the, le the levels of the treatment plan. But I love how maybe it's session two or three, whatever the treatment plan we're going through, we're discovering other things that are coming up. That's really the reason mm -hmm. why the thing hasn't gotten done in however many years. So um, for those clients that I do have, the coaching container has been beautiful because it's not just whatever issue they came with me for. They're uncovering other things that have been keeping them stuck. And so it's really a, it's a beautiful process to watch um, unfold. Um, and those who don't feel like they need as much support, we kind of do um, maybe only two or three sessions as far as like the intake, the review, and then the follow-up is sort of what it looks like. Um, and from there, if they need some extra support, then we can talk about what that looks like. So it really depends on the individual, how motivated they are, um, and what they're capable of doing. Cause I don't want somebody to sign on with me and they're not fully ready to commit and they feel like they're wasting their time, um, or anything like that. You know what I mean? Cause that yeah, can also yeah, feel Yeah. And that reminds me that, you know, sticky. I often end up talking to nurses and nurse practitioners about that idea that. It, you know, if we if we do give them a plan of care that they aren't interested in complying with or, you know, that we didn't partner with them to create, they don't want to come back and tell us that didn't go well. Right. Like that relationship is so important. And I think the nurse coaching part is where we learn that. Right. To create that opportunity for them to be vulnerable and come back and talk about those things that maybe they didn't know if they were ready to share yet or that next layer of why for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Cause I mean, I mean, I'm, I've been guilty of it. Um, as far as just agreeing with the plan because it sounds good and because you really want it to do it. And it's like, Oh yeah, I can totally do this. And then when it comes to executing it, you're like, mm, yeah. 
I really don't want to do this, but I don't really know why. So when it's, you know, session two, session three, and the things haven't gotten done, that's when we yeah. boil it down and we kind of, and it's not anything where it's, um, it's not accusatory. Everything's coming from a very beautiful, heart-centered, loving space, kind of like, okay, I want to help you. Let's figure out what's going on. Um, so that has been, that has been an awesome piece of it as far as before adding we hit record you told me that y- you were in the same cohort as jazz that i interviewed recently and she's an rn so i would like to hear kind of your yeah. thoughts on and i know you know from being in the course when we talk in zoom about like do i want to become an np can i do this as an rn a lot about scope of practice um what are your thoughts on that like because you guys are friends and you've talked about or, you know like oh she's an rn you're an np you're both coaching you're both educating um where are you at with that and and your thoughts about like the how we get trained as nurse practitioners you know it's so medical I always feel like it's not more nursing right it's it's the how to diagnose and um so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that topic yeah so from my standpoint with the NP background um I feel like the education that we use with disease process and medications and how they work and the interactions and things of that nature, I feel like that helps me when it comes to a lot of planning a little bit more, right? More than it would um, without having my NP. Um, And when it comes to interpreting labs, because I am trained to interpret, I can comfortably interpret labs. um, But my caveat, I'm not anybody's nurse practitioner. They're there. I'm there to consult as a, you know, with functional medicine. So my caveat is any changes, anything, any recommendations that I may have, um, they mm-hmm. need to clear that with their PCP. Um, so that's, you know, but that is, I mean, that's both synonymous, right? Whether you're an RN or an NP, depending on which scope that you are using as an RN. Because um, I do have my, I'm, I'm in South Jersey. And I do have an RN license in Pennsylvania. So my scope looks a little bit different depending on the state that I'm in, whether I'm seeing, you know, clients or things like that. So for me, I have to be mindful of that also because then it looks a little bit different. So then if I'm ordering labs for a client in um, in Pennsylvania, I'm working under my RN scope. So I need to have that physician sign off for the labs, yeah. even though I'm an NP, but I'm an NP in Jersey. So it's a little, it's a little <laughs> tricky. A lot of yeah, emails to the board Yeah, I think that's the thing, you know, I always <laughs> want, um, because from the outside, people looking in at what we're doing don't understand our scope and what we're able to do and what our limitations are. But, you know, my goal is always to empower nurses and nurse practitioners mm-hmm. to work in their scope, see people in the place they're licensed to see them. Um, and I think that's so important. We have to protect our license um, and do what's best for our patients. And I think innately, nurses are probably the most likely profession to do that, right? Like we have such a, a come to the table caring and worrying about others, right? Um, so I think that's a really good point is, you know, because I, I was talking about that today, actually, like having a compact license as an RN, but being a nurse practitioner, and what does that look like? And so if you do want to practice across state lines, yeah maybe you can as an RN, but you do have to get that guidance from, you know, the state board and probably a lawyer and like, you know, get enough information to protect yourself, protect your patients, document well, um, that you're really working in your scope. I think that's so important. So I'm glad that uh, you have that experience because you, where you live is pretty close yeah. to the border then it sounds like. Yeah, 30 minutes away. I'm right in the tri-state. So I'm like 30 minutes from Delaware, 30 minutes from um, Pennsylvania. <laughs> And I'm like two hours from New York. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm kind I, of, I think I've had a lot of students I mean, take fun. the course that live up in that area. And they're like, yeah, I have to think about New York and, you know, think about because the uh, the, the rules are different everywhere. Um, so it's important to talk about, too, I think. Um, so I was going to ask you about if you had a particular niche, but it sounds like no. Um but I was I was thinking about what you said about the age range of females that are underserved, you know, and that. um. And getting to 60 and 70, there's so much opportunity for us to help people that have been underserved with ig- just ignorance. Like they don't know. And if somebody had just told them like, hey, you should ask to have your vitamin D checked. Do you know how important that is for bone health and brain health? And um, So I, people are lucky. Are you are you in any ever in any yes. position where you are their primary care and they're, then they're coming to you for coaching on the side? Um, because, uh, you know, we talked about I'm really careful that when I left primary care, it was like, 
and I'm not doing that anymore because I did, I, I'm like, you have to have a primary care provider. It is not me. So is that a gray area for you at all? Or is it cl pretty clear? It's pretty clear. There is a line that's there. Um, there's, there's some things working down the pipeline where they, that may change. Um, but as of right now, there's a clear delineation um, that if they don't have a PCP, then I have one okay. that I work closely with that I can also defer to help them. And we kind of like work together. Um, so that's been a really cool opportunity that I've been able to have, which is great. Um, and I kind of want to circle back to what you had mentioned as far as that that age of the underserved, you know, in the 40s to like 60 something. Um, a lot of the elderly population that I take care of, um, I love them, love my mom's and my pop ups, you know, my 90 to, you know, 80s to like 104. Right. And a lot of them are women. And a lot of them have, there's a theme to why they're there, what issues they've been having. And I can't help but wonder if yeah. education was a little bit different, if testing was a little bit different, if um, nutrition was a little bit different, if they would be in those circumstances. So even though there is no real niche yet, because I still have an interest in all these different areas, and I just, I love all those different areas, um, I don't know. Part of it is kind of funneling yeah. into like aging well, because that's the biggest thing with the elderly population. Um, and right now I'm in, I just turned 40 in July. And so right in this age range, there's a lot of women who, or people I should say that are in the sandwich generation, right? So they have children and then they're also taking care of their, um, their parents or their in-laws. And so um, there's a lot of stress in that realm and so i wonder um how much we can do that way like i want to age well where i don't want my kid to have to necessarily worry about taking care of me you know because i'm going to age and it's going to happen so i don't know i don't have a boiled down niche but i wonder if it's going to start funneling into that realm because all of those whether it's a chronic disease hormonal health all of those lead towards aging well and that, I mean, um, I think that's a so population of people that are interested that. in that are the kind of people that are going to seek out people that offer what we offer, right? They're like motivated to learn more, to get accurate guidance through healthcare, to actually be able to age well. And you you um, <laughs> may have heard, I mentioned on the podcast last year that, uh, I think it was last year, that one of the big topics um, at the conferences I was going to is that the lifespan, you know, we have our life expectancy right now that has shortened, sadly, you know, the generations that are being born now have a shorter life expectancy than their parents did, which is very unfortunate. And I really think that there's going to be a rift there of people that continue the things that we know contribute to that in their lifestyle and choices have a shorter lifespan. And then we're going to have people that are taking all this knowledge that is emerging and running with it. And there, there's going to be a big rift between those two, I think, like people that are living much longer and people that are not. And mm. so what is 120 look like? And it, it, that aging well and, and um, cellular health and um, all the things that we talk about in functional medicine are opportunities to like, uh, support that group that's motivated and ready to get there um, and to continue to educate everybody. But I think that there are people looking for yeah. this type of information right now. And we're like on the crest of like learning so much about it. So it's a really fun niche to think about is like supporting people to live longer, healthier lives where they're not just living longer, but they're like, you're talking like you're talking about, you know, being yeah. active. And um, I tease my kids about that all the time. Like, <laughs> when yeah. I get older, you know, I like I still want to be active, but you guys better plan to hang out with me. <laughs> I tell them all the time, I will be the 85 year old on the dance floor that like that is going to be me. You don't have to worry about the cane. I'm not going to break the <laughs> hip like I'm going to be moving and grooving in my 80s. Um, that's that's the plan. You know what I mean? It's like um, not necessarily needing to ask for help to get up the steps or to bring in the groceries or whatever that looks like. And that all plays a part in bone health, muscular health. And um I think that I, I like to I like to give the idea to normalize it, um, not just normalize it, but make it seem tangible. Right. Like you don't have to do the extremes. It doesn't have to be, you know, a 10 out of 10 all the time. Right. It's all about um, really time under tension. So if you bring that tension down to something that is appropriate, something that 
you can do, whether it's your nutrition, exercise um, habits, or mental health practices, things like that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be at 100%, 100% of the time. You know, and I think that when people hear, um, you know, living well and doing all these things and lifestyle changes, they think, oh, you know, I have to do X, Y, and Z. It's just, it's too big. So um, I'm just not going to start because what's the point? Um, But I really want to be able to normalize life is happening. Life will happen. You want to be able to enjoy. But overall, um, you want to be able to do the things that are going to benefit you 10, 15, we 20, 30 years down before the road. we hit record that I had gone on your social media that you had shared. Um, and you would just, I know you just talked about that in something you recorded recently. I was, you know, cause I know I should be on camera more on social media. Like I know a lot about marketing that I'm not putting into practice. Um, but I know you were just talking about that, that like us pretending like we're perfect and we eat perfectly and that we lead perfect lives with perfect children. And you know, it, it, it's, it's not realistic. And that's kind of where I was going to go with that is, you know, we have, if we have teenagers, we want to impart this on them. And I imagine you're in the same situation I am where like you can give them great guidance, but they have choices to make. And I think 80, 20 is a really good target for, you know, teenagers too, is like you, they do want to go to the movies with their friends yeah. and get popcorn, you know? And so it's like, okay, where can we shift some without being like, okay, we're going to be completely different than all your other friends and their families. We're going to be weird and you have to do it a hundred percent of the time. They're not going to do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. I mean, like I can even, um, I mean, hundreds of times, you know, my daughter will come down or my son will come down and they want a snack and I'll look at it and she looks at me <laughs> and she's like, I know it's not good for my microbiome. I'm like, it's not. How are you going to balance it? She's like, I'll have a salad with dinner. I'm like, perfect. This is great. What else are we going to put on the salad? You know, and she's 12. So the fact that she's able to, and I look and I asked her, I'm like, what did you eat today that grew from the earth? And then she'll tell me, she's like, well, I had an apple. I'm going to have cauliflower with dinner. So she's able to tell me to add these things in um, so that if she wants to have, you know, a snack over here that I might, you know, raise a hairy eyebrow to, She's balancing it out. And so she she knows. And she's at that age, you know, 12, 13, hormones are changing, things like that. She knows that certain things may affect her differently. Same thing with my son. So I think that it's it's that education, it's that choice. I'm not saying, no, you cannot have this ever again. No, put that bagel down. No, you can have the bagel, but where's your fruit or where's this? Where's your source of protein? And then they'll add in like smoked salmon or something like that, which, you know, I feel like that's helpful and they can pull that when they go to their dad so they can actually help and you know what I mean and add those extra sources in because what they do when they're not with me I'm just hoping that I can give them yep. the education to make I think it know, was a zoom a meeting with my students decision. I was talking about recently that my sons had like a screenshot of my one son wanted to do one of the IFM diets so they had a screenshot of the pdf to to use for shopping with their dad and I'm just picturing, you know, him like, oh my gosh, what are they? And they're like, no, 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 we can't have that. And I love what your daughter said, microbiome. They're like walking through the store. This isn't great for my microbiome. <laughs> it's funny. We're they're 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 more aware than we were probably at their age, which is cool. Oh, a hundred percent. I was heating up pork roll with ketchup on a uh, um on like a bun of some sort. I remember doing that, you know, younger. Um Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't even mm-hmm. know if they know what pork yep. roll is. You know we what I mean? So there's just... better all the time because I'm like, yeah, I can think of how I ate when I was younger. And then, yeah, it just gets better. I, I wanted to circle back to you talked about earlier that yeah. you didn't ever plan to be an entrepreneur. And I didn't either. And learning all this is when I started to, to kind of get there. Um, what has that been like for you? And what's been most challenging about like having your your own practice? I know what the great things are of it. I think we can all imagine, you know, the the wonderful things about being your own boss. But what what has been most challenging for you? I think um, that's almost like an even split between um, like the in, the internal talk that I would have with myself that either I can't do this or maybe this is too big or maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, it's not as loud as it was before. Right. It's definitely getting a lot softer. And I feel like after having, um, you know, meetings with my clients or um, I also do a lot of educational workshops. Like I had a workshop last night that I did on like hormones and menopause at the local library. And it was 
phenomenal. So it's like doing things like that where you're kind of, you know, um, kind of reassuring like, okay, just stay on this train. You're on the right path. So I think that, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, imposter syndrome, if you would, is that's been a big challenge that I didn't necessarily expect. I didn't expect it to be easy, but I didn't realize how loud that is. It, um, and then just the logistics, just navigating the logistics of, um, you know, should I have a website? I don't have a website yet. Do I build a website? Am I going to pay for a website? Um, just those decisions that I wish that I had a... Um, I don't know, like a different type of a yep. rubric, like do this and it will definitely work. But that's not how it works because then, you know, I still have to navigate working full time and kids and taking kids to practices mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think it's the it's the balancing act of it because um, nothing right. is it's not going to be 50 50 all around. And so it's just trying to navigate that part of it. Um, but. I don't know. The more I do it, the more I'm like, okay, this feels good. So I'm just, I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving with that. I don't know what it's going to look like in the next year. I have an idea of what I want it to look like in the next year. Um, but I think navigating the imposter syndrome and navigating the logistics mm -hmm. and then sprinkle in social media, because I'm not an influencer, right? I don't want to be an influencer, but that's all really that you see. And so then there's the idea of you need to be an influencer, but I'm like, no, I don't need to do that. So there's just, you know, I think, a little mishmash I think the everything. imposter syndrome and our self-talk are probably. I don't know if that even answered the question. Yeah, no, you, you totally did. And I, I, yeah, I think the, the, the imposter syndrome uh -huh. and self-talk like are huge and under, oh. under discussed in the idea of being an entrepreneur and being a nurse or a nurse That's practitioner probably. and saying, are people going to want to pay to come see me? And, you know, what I know from all of my students sharing all this is yes, right? But we do have to get in front of them. There are things that I find for a lot of people, marketing what? is challenging or finding the audience and building a following. Um, and, and you know, I've wow. been working recently on how do I help support nurses with that? And when I have conversations with nurses recently, just in the last few weeks, quite a bit about the idea of... Um, building like a business program to for all of us to walk through together and say what's not working what is working what have we figured out so um so i am going to caveat if anybody wants to go to my website i'm going to have stuff on there in the next few weeks about how how we can all do this together because it needs to happen like nurses and nurse practitioners need to step into the fact that like we can really help change healthcare by by offering something different to our patients than what we're allowed to in the types of settings that we tend to be, find ourselves in okay so, okay, so I'm thinking about like for you, it I saw on your social media, like locally, you're putting up boosts at things. You're, you just mentioned you giving talks locally to educate people. Like what is what is getting in front of your audience look like for you? Well, it started with um, just belly to belly contact, right? So I, um, first I started with a Zoom, like a Zoom workshop um, where I invited, um, people to the Zoom. I am in a good relationship with my PCP's office and I asked to put up flyers for people who want to register for the Zoom. Um, local gyms that I'm friendly with, just kind of, you know, talking and conversing with people and saying, hey, I'm doing this, come join, you know, I'd love to see you there. And then from there, um, actually I put up flyers in libraries. Um, there is a women's gym that is local to me and they have like a, um, like a bulletin board where you can put up your business cards. You can put up flyers that you're having, things like that. So, um, the local library liked the idea of the workshop that I did, invited me to come in and do it for, you know, some of their patrons that go to the library. And I said, sure. And it was great. So um, there's a lot of community events, community days where I can put up a booth. Um, I linked up with another gym over in Pennsylvania. And so they've invited me to do some event spaces or some events, um, some talks. So I'm being a part of that. And um, it's kind of nice. It's scary because then now I'm talking in front of people, but um, the more I do it, the more I kind of enjoy it. There's, I feel like there's a piece that COVID took from us, which was that community aspect, was that community piece. And yes, I understand, you know, germs and it's the fall and all that sort of stuff and, and being out there with people, but there's something that you get 
with talking with people that you don't get talking to people through a screen. And I really do enjoy that. Just like how we enjoy talking to our patients when they come and see us, you, you get more out of having, you know, face to face. So um, I think it's, it's just that it's just putting yourself out there, whether it's on a business card or on a flyer and say, Hey, I really feel like I could help. Um, I'd love to have a talk and just kind of going from there. And I'm really big into groups lately. I'm writing a course on how nurses can run groups more effectively to like reach more people. Um, so I'm really into that topic. Did you have that fear the first time that like nobody was going to show up? Oh, hundred percent. I had one and where what, I had two people. And it's still, you just do it, right? Like fine. Yeah. I mean, okay. There's a little like, so then that's when I look and I say, okay, well, what hurts in this scenario? It's my ego. My ego hurts a little bit. Right. Um, but then it's funny because then, um, so part of the nurse coaching part that comes in where I'm kind of coaching myself, like, what could I have differently to maybe create a bigger audience? What was my resistance in really going out there and really advertising and marketing for this event? Um, so it's kind of like I do a little evaluation on myself. It's not to cut myself down as far as you should have done this. It's more so, okay, well, this is what happened. Um, it's going to happen. There's going to be a time where you pre create an appointment with somebody and somebody's going to keep canceling. There's going to be a time when you create an event and nobody's going to register. That's just part of the process, right? Um, and you just got to keep going and keep doing. And um I think yesterday there was about 20 people that that were there and that was great it was so great um and i really hope that it continues to be you know those yeah. numbers or, or or bigger but you know there's going to be another time where either nobody shows up or there'll be one person showing up um i just have to keep showing up i really like that you're doing that in getting in front of people because you know what i think of when i think of you know if if our audience for something that we want to offer isn't where we want it to be. It's not for lack of people that need help, right? It, and there's people that are looking for us. So how do how do we get to where they can see us, I think is the trick, right? And um, how do we speak the language that they can hear? Yeah. To the pain, what are their pain points? How, how can we help them understand that we're offering something different? Like there's all these parts of that that I think are really interesting. Um, and I was listening to something recently that was talking about, you know, people really stress when they're starting a business about business plans. And so I was looking at that and I didn't do a very good job. Like I didn't do a business plan when I started my, my nurse coaching practice. Um, and, and I, and it, it's talking about how treating a new business like ours is more of a startup instead of developing a business plan to assume, you know, what people are going to want from you and to create everything around your assumption of what somebody might want from you that you think you know who they are and what you should give them. And instead treat it like a startup where you try things and see what sticks. And I think that's what we do in this type of business anyway, is like you show up and it doesn't work and, or you don't reach the people you wanted to reach or um, your marketing idea didn't work or, you know, we just keep trying things and we figure out who is our audience, who, who, who am I speaking to that resonates with this? And, and, and even like in functional medicine, we talk about niches. It's like, next thing you know, you've had 10 friends that referred their friends to you, be not, not your friends, but you know, your patients will tell their friends like, oh, I feel great. And it was because I worked with Rose. And then that next person with similar problems. And next thing you know, you're an expert in something that you weren't even planning on being your niche because people kept sending their friends to you. And I, it happens all the time to my students. So I know it happens. It's not just me. Um, but that it, I really think that idea is interesting that like maybe business plans aren't the way to go in the in the classic sense that we have to like assume who our people are and what we're going to give them and instead let them tell us and let the numbers really guide us, you know, okay, well, I gave a talk on, you know, low energy and difficulty losing weight and 100 people showed up. So maybe that's what people in my area are looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... And I feel like that's one thing that I do love about between functional medicine and primary care, because there's so many different avenues. There's so many different aspects. Like I did um, one talk that I did was on vitamins 
And um, it's interesting when you talked about marketing, like I had to make sure I'm like, I'm not selling anything. I'm not affiliated with any vitamin company. Um, this is strictly information that you can, you can, you know, gain that way when you go to the store, when you're going online, looking to see what choice you should make based upon your needs. So it's kind of back to that tailoring aspect. Like I'm not going to give somebody advice just off the cuff because it all depends on what's going on and what you're trying to mitigate. So it's kind of going back and boiling it down to taking out the algorithm. Yes, there is a rubric of how you should treat or what you should look for, but not everybody fits in that box. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest part for me that I love to share is that, you know, just because you don't fit in that box doesn't mean that you can't get help. We just have to find what your shape is, you know? So, um, oh, yeah. that's, so that's, that's kind of where I like to, where I like to go. And even, um, touching on getting in front of people, there's also, there's a, it's a two part with, I think, being a provider. You have the um, people who love their provider or who respect their provider and want to know what they have to say. And then you have the other part who have had a bad experience, who don't trust medical professionals and who don't want anything that you have to say. So I feel like um, getting in front of people and they can get a little sense of your care, they can get a sense of your personality, they can get a sense of what you're trying to help them with, may soften the blow a little bit and maybe they will feel comfortable coming to you. So I feel like there's also those target audience that I would love to see. And I feel like you get that going belly to belly and talking to people mm -hmm. and people kind of coming out and you know just being a little bit more curious about what you have to say or what you can offer. And I feel like that's kind of, that's like where the magic is a little bit. And when, I think when it's a group too, like what you're doing locally, like then you, you benefit too from all those people being able to share with each other and you figuring out the themes of like, what do they have in common that they need help with or the benefit of them being able to talk to each other, connect and, and know just by coming to hear you talk that there are other people around that are struggling with similar things. There's so much oh, value there. Yeah, like it was beautiful, especially I mean, the one big thing I'm like, Oh, I hope that people are interactive. Because that'd be really awkward if I'm asking for people to <laughs> volunteer and help and nobody does. And um, I think the first question that I had that I asked for people to speak themselves into the room. And I had like six people raise their hand. I'm like, Oh, this is good. This is gonna be great. So um, it's kind of, you know, there and everybody sort of worked with each other and kind of supported each other and shared similar stories. Um, and it was very interactive and it was great. And I think that's the energy when you're in a community setting, when you're in a group setting, um, that really makes it so much more beneficial of kind of coming together. So that, like I was, it was that weird, um, like that endorphin feeling that you get, you know, after just either like having a long run or having a good workout or it's, it was kind of like that. So it was awesome. So I'm just, I'm looking forward to doing more and hoping that that group aspect and that community piece can really bring people in together a little bit more. Yeah. All uh, right. Okay, so this all is going to, I'm going to deviate, but it all comes back to this being the thing. It's like we were talking a little bit about being on camera and getting in front of people and talking. And and for me, you know, I, I think sometimes my students don't believe me when I'm like, I'm not crazy about being on camera. I like, I feel like I care enough about what I want to share with people that I just do it. And it's easier now than it used to be. But the first time that I really had to get in front of a room and talk was when I was teaching. I mean, I did a public speaking class before, but like the first time I had to do it in nursing was to get up and teach a room full of students that were uh, studying to become nurses. Um, and so I know that you have had that role also. So I wanted to kind of segue to that, the role of like what we saw in our education and where we're at now with that in education, like I was trying to sprinkle in functional medicine stuff when I was teaching students that were learning nutrition and I was teaching nutrition at the, at the college level for nurses and then also teaching them other uh, content and trying to get them to think about the why. And I think in some cases before they hit the ground running with people and really been in practice, it's they're just trying to hang on to the, the details that they need to like pass the NCLEX and go care for people for the first time. But yeah. I just think for me, the thing that I feel it was lacking, I taught at the same school that I had gone to. And um, 
I remembered not thinking there was an option outside the hospital or long-term care facility when you graduate. And now here we are full circle where I'm trying to like, I'm not trying to get anybody to leave the bedside or stop working in a hospital, but I think there's so much room for some nurses to offer something different. And like, that's really exciting, but it's, I don't think it's being taught in schools that we can go offer something that aligns with our values as a nurse, you know, so many nurses tell me, oh, I, um, what I offer my patients in my work setting, like in a hospital or in in an allopathic clinic is, looks nothing like what I do for myself and my family at home. Um, So I wanted to hear some of your thoughts on educating and, and being a learner as a nurse practitioner too, like your experience and thoughts on that. Yeah, I feel like um, it's definitely, it's changed and it's been changing, right? So When I was teaching, um, I taught lecture one semester, but I taught critical care. And so working in the ICU and teaching critical care, I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, And I feel like of the um, instructors that were there, a lot of the teachers have been, a lot of the professors have been professors for years. And so they've been so far removed from the bedside and nothing against that because they've owned their craft and they've honed their craft. But I feel like it kind of reads a little bit different. If, you know, Tuesday I have two vented patients on three different drips, four different drips. And then on Wednesday I'm teaching about ventilators. So then you can kind of, it's, it's fresher and you can just relate it a little bit more with the students. Um, And then in clinicals, I was a clinical instructor where I took off my coat, gloved up, gowned up, Let's go in. We're doing this. We're doing that. Um, Just because I was still working at the bedside with a lot of either new nurses or seasoned nurses. And um, there's just, you know, there's certain things that we learn. I was taught by the old school nurses who if you didn't make your bed real crisp, there's no wrinkle in a sheet. Not like you were getting (laughs) completely reamed out. Right. So, you know, I love those old school nurses who who taught us well, Um, but it's very different now. It's very different. I think there's something to be said about that. So I think that pulling that in and, um, you know, between educating the students and educating my uh, my patients and my clients, um, there's a balance where you want to be able to educate and guide versus tell. Right. So then it, it reads a little bit different when you have your student and then when you have your client and your patient, because you don't want them to put up a wall where they're not trying to hear what you have to say. So before I educate and before I try to teach, I wanna know what they're coming in with. I wanna know what their baseline Mm -hmm. knowledge is because I don't wanna necessarily repeat what they already know. um, And I don't wanna act like whatever they know is not the right thing. So I just wanna know what their baseline is and what they're coming in with. And if they would like to know more, cause I have something that I can offer them that could be helpful. That's so similar to running groups too. I think like if you're going to do a group and you don't know who your audience is and what their current knowledge base is, you could be, I, you know, who was I talking to somebody the other day about like, it was like a talk that we could get, it was for vegans. And it's like, well, you can't really go in there and be, you know, talking about the carnivore diet. Like nobody's going to listen, you know, who's your audience. And like, we have to meet them where they are. Exactly. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of that. And I think just that alone is what separates a lot of allopathic model with functional model, because I feel like um, just take an inventory and kind of taking a seat back real quick, just to see, all right, well, you know, what are your, cause you hear all the time, I'm sure you're, well, I eat really healthy. Okay, well, what's an example? Like, just walk me through mm-hmm. your day as far as like, what you're taking in. And so then when, you know, you're teaching about reading labels or really what this means, or, you know, the hidden things in here, um, I mean, I know I was guilty of it up until like, I'm, I'm constantly learning stuff where I had no idea. And I'm like, oh, this is wild. And I think there's that where if, you know, somebody says, you know, you know, like I said, you know, yeah, I eat healthy all the time. I don't understand why this isn't happening. Um, well, what's their definition of healthy? What is like, what does that mean? Because everybody has their own definition of health. So it's kind of boiling it down to what that means and, you know, supporting them and helping them get healthier. Yes. Oh, I love it. So you, as as we're wrapping up, I want to, so, so you worked in a lot of these settings. So you've been a nurse for, I'm kind of thinking it long enough that maybe 
burnout wise, I'm thinking of how many years you said you're in the hospital. Burnout wise, you know, a, a, a lot of people come to find functional medicine, holistic nursing because they're burned out already in healthcare. And um, I know for me, I was disen disenchanted maybe is the word. Like, I don't know if I was burned out as much as I was just like, gosh, none of this is what I wanted to be offering. And, and, you know, like you said, functional medicine is like coming home, you know, learning these skills. And that's what so many nurses tell me. Um, what is, what has all of this meant for your career? Like, were you there like burned out and you needed something new or um, how has this changed your, your career? I feel like. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't burnt out. Um, I think that things definitely changed. I think at the bedside, um, I think COVID was very, it was, you know, it was, it was tough for most of us, a lot of us, all of us. Um, for me personally, um, it did something to me where I did not get the rush anymore. I didn't feel excited anymore taking care of somebody who was super sick. That completely that excitement was not there anymore because I was I was exhausted from seeing it day in and day out and really just took me down. I just didn't like it. Um, and so then I was excited to get into the provider role. And I wasn't burnt out from being a nurse practitioner, but I was just frustrated, truthfully, just frustrated because I feel like, um, you know, we're kind of taught and trained and only allotted enough time to put a Band-Aid on most of what's going on and come back in three months, come back in six weeks and um, not really giving a lot of guidance between that time or, um, you know, just not having enough time to educate on a lot of different things that patients can do to support themselves during, you know, the time, like even simple as PPIs where people are on it for two years, three years, and they were never told that it really should be on for only, they should only be taking them for about eight weeks. So it's things like that. And um, I don't know, wanting to do more and wanting to educate more and just, you know, you're given, well, we don't have enough time for that. So it wasn't like a burnout. It was just more of a frustration um, just because me personally, I didn't feel like I was giving good care. I didn't feel like I was really helping how I wanted to help. And so I think functional medicine allowed for that release for me. So it's like kind of selfish in a way, but like not because then other people are gaining from that. Right. Oh yeah. 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 Well, and I think that that's, that's it for me too. I think I just, I think I was doing what I had learned to do and offer and it wasn't moving the needle for people the way that I really wanted to. So I, I think the way you said it is better than the way I said it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, uh, Rose, before we wrap up today, I wanted to give you a chance to like, what, what would you say to people listening that are like behind you kind of thinking about following in similar uh, path, like functional medicine, nurse coaching, your own practice, like all these things that you've, you've done recently in your career? Yeah, I would say um, exercising patience. And that's something that I have to tell myself, patience in um, yourself, patience in building that confidence, patience in um, allotting for change and allotting for things to maybe not work out the first time, but maybe the second or the third time. Because I feel like um, there's been a couple times where I'm just like, I don't know, it would be so much easier if I just either continue working in my current practice or find another practice. Um, but it won't be fulfilling. And I feel like if somebody's in that same space where they could stay and it'll be fine, but they just won't get that extra oomph that they're looking for, just be patient and kind of keep going with it and kind of flowing with it because things, I truly believe that things do unfold when they're supposed to unfold, whether you receive the lesson when you're supposed to receive it or maybe 10 weeks down the line. So I would say if you're thinking about it and um, if you're leading with curiosity, open that door take that course, um, send that email, talk to that friend, or just find out a little bit more and see if that's something. But if you're curious about it, there's a reason why you are. And I think that you should kind of look into that a little bit more. I, yeah, I, I think that's spot on. Like I remember looking up nurse coaching and Inca and like all these like threads of functional medicine and being curious before I really like took the leap to start learning. Um, but it's exactly what you're talking about. You get that nagging, like th there's something 
there's something simmering that I'm supposed to move into. And, and patience is hard because like we want whatever it is, you know, I want to know everything right now that I need to know. And for, you know, and that's not, that's not the reality. It is like, um, nursing our careers aren't a marathon right we're always learning something new and doing something more dynamic and different than what we were before and then we are able to even uh, care for our patients better right than yesterday yeah and um i feel like that's the cool part there's i mean there it is i don't even know what the deepest part of the ocean is but you can deep dive <laughs> into almost every single thing and i think that can be overwhelming in itself so kind of putting knowing when to deep dive and knowing when to just stay snorkel level. And it's still okay because you still will be able to help people at that level because they're still up in the air somewhere. They haven't come down Ooh, yeah. yet. That's a good point, right? Because most of the stuff that we do know when we go on these deep dives, we would completely overwhelm our patients if we just like shared all that. If you got up and did a local community talk and shared everything you know about the microbiome, people would be like, wait, like, come on. I started to. I started taking a tangent because I got really excited yesterday and I was like, Sir, let me just bring it back a little bit. I'm like, we won't go there. That can be for another day, but we're going to nope. stay right back here. Yeah, because it's, it's I don't know. <laughs> I, I can geek out on some things and I try not to, um, unless they want to hear it, then that's great. But if not, and it's too much, then I don't want people to be scared and like run away and be like, this is too big. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you, you for me, I, I, I think you can usually tell from their questions, like how much further they want to go. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. This is a really great conversation, Rose. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. This was awesome. This is so great. Yeah, I'm going to share your social media. I think, you know, I'm realizing like, okay, I have the time now. I'm like, I need to be like checking in, seeing what you guys are working on. Everybody go follow Rose and everybody that's been speaking on the podcast so we can all like stay in the loop and see what everybody's working on. Um, so we'll share her social media and how to connect with her. Um, and I would love to have you back and hear how things are going in the future. That would be fun too. Yeah, I'd love that little part too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody, <laughs> until next time. Be well. Bye. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the Functional Nurse Podcast. If you want to help spread the word of the powerful role nurses can play as true healers using functional medicine practices, consider sharing an episode with a nurse friend or on social media and click the subscribe button to stay informed of newly released episodes. You can also watch the video version of many episodes on my YouTube channel, Bridget Sager NP. Visit the website, BridgetSager.com to sign up for my newsletter and to learn more about the current courses I am offering in functional medicine, nutrition, and holistic nursing overall, as well as many other resources. You can also visit the links in the show notes below to learn more about topics discussed in this episode. Until next time, be well. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the Functional Nurse Podcast. If you want to help spread the word of the powerful role nurses can play as true healers using functional medicine practices, consider sharing an episode with a nurse friend or on social media, and click the subscribe button to stay informed of newly released episodes. You can also watch the video version of many episodes on my YouTube channel, Bridget Sager NP. Visit the website, BridgetSager.com, to sign up for my newsletter and to learn more about the current courses I am offering in functional medicine, nutrition, and holistic nursing overall, as well as many other resources. 
You can also visit the links in the show notes below to learn more about topics discussed in this episode. Until next time, be well.